Hey everyone, uh, welcome to this uh, making up video about If Found, uh, the video game that we've been working on for years. <laughs> uh, if Found came out last year in 2020, it's kind of like a one year kind of since. Uh, so it's really cool to be part of the festival and uh, it's like a chance to go back and to dive deep into all the bits and pieces and to, to reminisce. So I'm Laura McGee, I was the director on the game and I'm joined by Eve. Hello, Eve. Hello. Uh, we're both in Dublin, but but separated by by time and space. Well, not time, just space. <laughs> um, so yeah, this is a talk that I put together uh, last month, but I'm gonna do it do it over uh, for public consumption, and I'm going to. Uh, this is me. I'm gonna give it with Eve, so I'm not just talking to myself. I'm gonna have a little buddy. Uh, here is uh, Cassio and Jack just enjoying like the. The lovely view. This is such a such a good shot of like Akil. I think this is like literally like Dua or something by Leah. It's so nice. And it just feels so cozy. Look at the little slippers and yeah. everything. It's really nice. The um, colors are stunning too. Mm, like the yeah, nice pastels. Yeah. Um. So yeah, like if you haven't played the game, like there will be like some slight spoilers, but mostly we're gonna go into like, um, things we learned during development. You know, issues that came up. Uh. So. I think like you know it's a good reason to go play the game and if you've played it it's like a, like a, like hopefully this uh half an hour is like a nice reason to return as well hmm. uh specifically i was asked to give a talk about if Found's journey so here is a map that will display if if Found's journey all the way from donegal uh where i'm from this is like a lovely shot uh, of fintra beach uh, in donegal you can probably, I think my house is like way back here in the distance, but don't stalk me. <laughs> no, you can't see it. It's somewhere in here. It's like a lovely, lovely, lovely little small place. But I'm from this small town in Donegal on the West Coast. And then the journey of F5 went from there all the way to there, <laughs> which is tiny, uh, to Ackle, which is another lovely place in the West Coast. Um, this is Keem Bay, where a lot of things take place in the game. Uh, here is... Shants on Kimbe, for example, uh, with more art by Leah, nice pastels. Uh, the, the, in reality, the journey was more like this. So over to the UK and all around and back and over to the States. Uh, so it's a very circuitous route. Uh, what is If Find? You know, this is the question uh, that, how do I describe it? And I was like, oh, I'll put it into Google and here's all the results. Uh, here's like the little trailer, which you can also see on the Steam page. Uh, it's a game about, it's a game with lots of purples. Uh, I think uh, you can see that, like the background behind me, the background behind Eve, lots of purples. Um, but yeah, we really like going for really impressionistic and like strong colors. Um, the game itself is a game where you are raising, uh, that's the kind of central mechanic. And you are playing as Cassio, uh, a young woman who is kind of reading back over her diary and erasing all these painful moments. Um, but she goes on a journey, uh, as you will see, that that is not the end of the story, thankfully. Uh, this is the team. Eve in the middle, myself beside her. Uh, Alexandra, our social queen. Uh, Brianna Chu, they like were our second artist. Uh, I'll talk about some of the bits and pieces they did. They really helped us out. Uh, Leah Young, who was our lead artist. Tim, our lead coder. Then we have... Uh, Brogan, who helped with design and everything, Matt and Ellie, uh, who both did Sound of Music. So in this little chat, uh, the main three points that I want to build on is the mechanic of erasing, where it came from, the history of it, how it was developed, um, building the studio, how this whole thing started from, you know, started from me and Leah and me myself before that, how that became the Dreamfield team we have now. And then I also want to talk about what I learned about story structure, i.e. making a good game, hopefully. Um, here's, a, here's a lovely piece of art, another lovely piece of art by Leah from the ending. This is some of those extra pieces that we got to do um, for like the big patch and the uh, Switch version that came out in uh, October last year. And we added these drawings to the ending, which uh, I'll talk about a little bit. So where we start like this is a long journey so we're going to go back to 2011 10 years that's wild the outside existed in 2011 from what i hear <laughs> um 
I started, uh, so I moved to Scotland, so from, from uh, Ireland, from moving to Dublin, I went to Scotland because at that time there was so much more of a, a game scene uh, in Scotland. I did a master's over there and then started working for companies over there. Uh, one of the things I designed during my master's was uh, this little prototype actually, where uh, if, you can't, if you can't draw, this is like a tip for programmers, you can make art with spheres. So this is a little game called Fuum, which means a sound and you control a little ball and you could run around the planets and you could jump from planet to planet. So it was kind of like a Mario Galaxy in 2D kind of thing. Uh, but the really cool trick, so this was a class where I had to, I had to learn DirectX, which is kind of like a graphics library for like Windows, uh, and I had to code uh, in DirectX. Um, and probably like, you know, my, uh, my go-to thing is like, while I couldn't wire them with uh, the technical chops, and DirectX is so, so mucky and I'm, I'm not a graphics programmer, I could like come up with something kind of like nifty and not before scenes. So I come up with this idea where you could have two parallel kind of pieces of art and one would erase into the other. So you'll see it here in a second. So yeah, here you can see uh, there's this white foreground and then this like background here. Uh, and then there's no actual art. It's just like every sweet art. It's like a stencil. It cuts through. Uh, this is like a much cleaner version of the same. Uh, and so it was a really neat trick. Um, it created like really nice kind of confusing graphics. And I used it for like in, in a few things. Like there was this game that I was working on for probably half a year, which was a, a platformer where you save characters and you ran hand in hand and they were being chased by this horrible storm. And with that storm, it was created out of uh, that same stencil effect. And so that's where the erasing mechanic came from. At this point, it was only ever being used for one layer. Um, and it wasn't quite erasing yet. It was just like, oh, it's a, it's a weird visual trick. So the other thing, so the other part of this poll. So yeah, these three things I'm going to talk about. I'm not going to talk about them in order. I'm going to talk about it off them at each step because they all develop throughout. So on the game structure side, um, I'd now, I'm now making games for a couple of years. You know, I've been using X and A, uh, I started using Flash, uh, all these things. Um, but all my games were terrible. They were so bad. Like often, like boom, I would have a cool mechanic and or a cool like graphical thing, uh, but it would never really add into anything greater than the sum of its parts. So this was something I was still struggling with. Uh, how, to, how to make a game that felt like you wanted to keep playing and it felt like it actually goes somewhere. Um, at the same time, I got really kind of burnt out working in Scotland. Um, and I even like, you know, became like a bit disillusioned, I'd say, with working in teams. I was like, oh, if you want to make like really important, like personal work, it is not possible to do that in a team, you know, like whether that's because it's hard to communicate or also maybe even more importantly, it's like, how do you get money to make personal cool games, you know? Uh, so those were definitely, uh, that was definitely a big challenge. So I came back to Ireland and the next step, uh, so it was kind of like my solo career. So a, between 23 and 2013 rather, in 2015 was when I was kind of freelancing. Um, I was, you know, still going to lots of like indie games events, uh, especially like in the UK and in Europe, such as like TIG Jam, uh, which was like, uh, from TIG Source, where lots of like UK, TIG Jam UK specifically, where lots of UK game makers would meet up, uh, and Feral Vector, which was called A Bit of All Right at the time, and Amaze. And so there's these places where people were making experimental small games and like sharing lots of ideas. Um, and then the opposite end of the spectrum of that was something like GDC, which is uh, where the AAA industry and the indie industry, indie industry, I mean, probably that's what I like to call it actually, was kind of like crashing together a little bit. So you'd have like the big companies and then you'd have like the little indies making them, making them seem a bit cooler. Um, what are your thoughts on GDC, Eve? I've never been. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'd like to go at some point uh, just to have the experience. Yeah. Although it feels weird to, to think about going to like a huge conference like that now mm -hmm. in the world of 2021. It's like, I, know. Um, I, I stopped going to things for a while because I did want to wait until the fun is done and then I go to things. 
Um, I think I'd probably lean towards going to some of the smaller festivals of the GDC just because it's such a big journey, you know? This was, you know, I was in a lucky position where I was able to go from Ireland the whole way across to, like, GDC or something. Like, a couple times I got scholarships uh, Mm -hmm. that helped with travel and accommodation and stuff like that. But, you know, that isn't something that's accessible to most. uh, Yeah, yeah. Especially queer indie developers, you know? Um, Yeah. So there's always this dichotomy where, you know, you'd have experimental, like, uh, game creators, you know, like, often trans... And they'd be making all this, like, cool work. And then you'd have, like, a AAA studio being like, oh, that's so inspiring. Uh, making lots more money than uh, the small person. You just couldn't make a living at it. Um, so I was kind of... Uh, and I was also teaching. Teaching at DIT was, you know, probably, like, most of, like, my income and my uh, and my uh, mm. and my stability. That's, like... It's not called TUD, but that was... Yeah, I was getting the students to make small games and everything as well. You can see my like desk in a little workspace. Um, I'd like posters of my games, posters of like Elsa Ryerson's art, which is really awesome. Um, I mean, like, here's some pictures of some of the games I made. Uh, this is one where you like sit inside a tent, uh, and it rains on top of you. Uh, this is a picture of someone inside the tent, uh, and when you're in there, um, it's like thunder and lightning, but you have like a little controller that will affect all the art so just like playing around with like experimental little things um one one game i think uh that i think was kind of a turning point i think it's like a pretty good game is train song have, have you played it eve uh yeah but it has been a few years mm-hmm. i mean i made this with dave mccabe of uh, spooky doorway fame who, who who's since like worked on dark side detective like kind of mm. irish um point and click games which are very funny he's a very funny writer so with mm. this i was like oh i want to stop you know getting so bogged down with game mechanics uh because a they take a lot of effort and i want to do something which is like as simple as possible so it's essentially like a point and click game or like even a point and walk uh you're like a businessman on this like mis- mystical train and it's all made out of clay and you're traveling through all these different worlds and it's just full of like strange characters with strange stories and it actually opens up with an F and V, uh, which was fun. It's uh, all you... stock footage. Sorry. No, Did you on. do the art for Train Song? It was like both of us, so. Mm. Uh, it's really nice. Yeah, like, it was fun. So I, I think a... I did the backgrounds and the carriages and then half of the mm. claymation characters. Mm. And then Dave made the main character, I'm pretty sure. He, like, I think he had it like hanging around. And did uh, half of the other ones. There's a really good character at the end. Dave did like that big, huge, like, uh, kind of like demon at the gates of hell kind of thing. Uh, okay. Yeah. Nice. So it was like a mixture. So like we spent, I think, a day on it, and then I kind of worked on it myself for like uh, another like few weeks, basically. Yeah. Uh, but that was very fun. And for me, it was kind of like this turning point where, you know, I started to realize that it wasn't just the mechanics, but it was how you structure the mechanics, you know, and how. It can you can use something very simple, you know. And it's playing games with, like the catamites and stuff, uh, mm. but like if you put that into a bigger structure, um, and part of that at the same time, I was going to like a writing group for experimental writers, uh, run by Dave Lorden, and I think that was like probably you know one of one of the biggest things that affected my I would say like the way that I write, you know. And I realized that if you can write a good story and a good short story even you can apply that same concept to um video games uh, and the, the main concept here was like uh structure so often like with structure it gets bogged down in like what do you think of like hero of a thousand faces and like the hero's journey kind of stuff i'm not a fan <laughs> no uh, me neither uh i think there's people who've done like really good critiques of it mm-hmm. um from a bunch of different angles, um, like it tends to kind of, it's it's not a bad description of some stories, yeah. but people do this thing where they get like really into it and then they want to make every story fit it, which but just why? isn't true. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, like you try to make think like, everything fit into it, which is, doesn't make sense. Uh, yeah. And the the kind of fiction that we were writing in this course was like generally flash fiction. Uh, and in flash fiction, um, it's basically you want to introduce an idea and then go somewhere with the idea. You know, like the, the most obvious way to see this is like a Twilight Zone twist, you know, 
And what I realized about this is that you are seeing something from multiple perspectives. So it's giving the idea depth, you know, uh, mm-hmm. and this not only applies to like stories, I can see how this could apply to games and even like parts of games such as mechanics, you know, there's a very good video uh, about how uh, Sit Mario 3D World actually uses, uh, I'm going to like, probably not pronounce this very well, but Kosho Tenketsu uh, to structure how it introduces a mechanic. So it will give you a mechanic in a fairly safe area where you can try it out. It will develop it, like the challenge will increase. It will provide a twist on the mechanic, so you'll see it in a different light. And then it'll give you one last chance to uh, to uh, show you your mastery. Uh, mm-hmm. And I think there's a game that doesn't also is very good at this. It's a very underrated indie game, actually. Um, by Nithlis, who made like Knit Stories and... Uh, Lots of ride games at the moment, but he made a game called uh, Night Sky and levels came in like packs of, I think, three or four. And then the last level was always a lot easier than the previous one. It was kind of like a celebration, which was really neat. Um, So Mm -hmm. I started both combining this with writing, but also game design. And this kind of culminated in, uh, first of all, a game slash performance called The Infinite Notebook. Uh, so I'll just quickly show what this looks like. Uh, I'll speed it up loads. So here, like, I'm controlling... This was built in Unity. I'm controlling, like, moving the the camera and it's spinning around. Um, but then here is where it gets cool. I start uh, zooming into the words. So here you can see it starts zooming in and zooming in and zooming in. Uh, so I combined this kind of zooming mechanic with this story that talked about a zooming mechanic in a sense, you know, uh, and this was probably like the first thing I was really super proud of. I thought like this, like, this like kills. It's so good. Like at some point I'll get to, uh, you know, parts of it find their way into it fine, but then, you know, like you'll see the zooming and we'll get to it later, but it's not really at the forefront. And I, I think there's potential for it at some point. Um, but yeah, instead of really prescriptive story structures where it's like even like five acts or three acts and this happens and this happens and this happens you can really just boil it down to like even something that works for like a joke you know the structure of a joke which is like uh establishing something you know developing it and then like a twist an unexpected turn on it which gives it all this extra depth and then you know there's other kind of very short ones another one i was thinking of recently was like i think it's a brandon sanderson's one which is like promises progress and pay off you know uh, which is very plot heavy but also i think it can be applied to anything so i was getting a lot of inspiration from uh these other worlds uh than uh than just looking at video games at the time uh and then also this kind of culminated in a side project uh curtain was originally was supposed to take a weekend or something and it was uh it was like a little break from uh, my magnum opus or something which was a very silly game um which is always the way uh and it's actually really really good you know there's a lot of like personal there's a lot of strong feelings you know it's like it's six seven years so it's like easier to look back on it and not be so caught up in it uh but in curtain which is like an experimental first person game so i was taking you know kind of uh i was trying to like go somewhere new with games like like walking sims but also like just immersive sims in general um like deus ex and before that Ultima underworld 2 where the story was always something that had happened in the past and you're kind of uncovering it bit by bit by bit and i really wanted a story that happened in the moment uh and then another thing was like you know using using the weaknesses that i had which was uh using them to my advantage so i couldn't have a character on screen because it would look very not very well so instead, uh, the character is represented by her text box, which never goes away. So her voice is always at you. Uh, and uh, yeah, I think it has a nice structure. Like the structure is paid off in these like different um, time zones, essentially. You see the apartment in the present day, the apartment maybe six mm-hmm. months later. And then you see a, a final apartment where the main character is, you know, kind of living on her own again. And kind of like starting from mm-hmm. scratch. And, you know, there's lots and lots to talk about in Curtain. Um, you know, I wanted to make a, a game that was kind of like an anti-serious game of the time, you know, where they were always very neat and tidy and had very clean, um, 
takeaways and uh, also show how like the effects of trauma and all this like stuff can like linger with you um but ultimately for this point of this talk it was a critical you know it was a critical success it got written up by like websites uh i won uh, an amaze award which was amazing you know like here is me with my cool jacket and like probably one of the best like design words in the world but this was like a total shock i literally thought when they were reading out like, all the other words that they forgot to include <laughs> curtain I wasn't going to make a fuss and then Curtin won the overall thing and it's like what uh and I think I gave a speech about how you know it was just cool you know for a small experimental game to win and just like how how important these small experimental games are to everything you know this was kind of uh early alt game you know we go through all these different waves of like alternative games and they were called alt games at that point but now I've made this um I didn't really get much money from it. The most money I got was like the prize money from uh, Amaze. Um, yeah, releasing on Steam wasn't really on the cards. There was like kind of a different ecosystem. I don't think people were, I don't think people were looking for this kind of game at the time. Uh, but yeah, how can I make a living at this? And I think this kind of speaks to the catch money too. A lot of experimental and queer um and marginalized game developers find themselves in which is like you can make cool work that like matters to you but uh people with money are looking for things that already exist but like with a fresh coat of paint i don't know what do you think eve what are your thoughts on yeah, uh, i i think it's uh it's something that's very similar in a lot of different industries it's just kind of like more <laughs> the games industry mm. uh it feels like like all of the the games industry is you know similar to other artistic industries except all of the capitalist parts are like ramped up. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah. So it's like yeah. you know, uh, some some like small number of companies will make a lot of money. Uh, yeah. But yeah, it's tricky. I like there has to be ways to support the more developers. So yeah, so I am um, doing my own solo stuff. I'm not gonna make a team, but I kind of realized I can only do so much by myself that I do like need to start working with others, you know? Um, Curtain's art is perfect for what it is, but it is also not the most appealing, you know? It is like a very intentional, intentionally like off-putting game, you know? I think as you play the game, the art becomes you kind of learn to like read it and see it and like speaks to the themes but it is not uh, a pretty game I would say. I mean I think it is a really pretty game but it's not um it's not a mass market game you know and I was also getting kind of burned out working solo I, w I will admit um mm -hmm. so I kind of at this point I'd moved on from like kind of writing circles to like zines and was making stuff like handmade so, like, this is probably where I met you, Eve. You were in such circles. Well, actually, I met you before this, because I met you through, um, uh, there was, like, a cool online event that, uh, Solani Stewart put together. What was that called? Yeah. I do not remember what it was called. It was, like, it was an like online... right at the height. Was it, like, an okay. online alternative to E3, or was that, like, a next thing that they did? But basically... It was getting experimental yeah. game makers together um but i saw that like okay like maybe i can give teams a shot again uh and mm -hmm. i met leah uh this is some of leah's like old comics and stuff cool boy friday mm -hmm. like she was doing at the time um this was the first piece of art that uh i pitched her basically a a uh, a space western with starring cats mm -hmm. two like space cat cowboys and this is some art for a planet that they would visit that she did. I thought it was really cool. She came up with all these stories and stuff it as well. Really cool. Huh? Mm. It is. It neat. is really cool. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but the main thing was, you know, was working with her, honestly. Uh, we met up for like a one day jam. We made a game called Leanne Le Havis Saves the Universe, which is about pop star Leanne Le Havis saving her dog, which actually reused the gravity planet mechanic uh, a little mm. bit. Uh, and that was quite a fun game. I mean, yeah, uh, it was a fun time working with her. And we really, like, you know, we really got along and a lot of same interests. And she was just, like, nice and chill, which was uh, the yeah. main thing. And yeah. uh, she started working with me. And I kind of realized that, oh, wow, yeah, you can 
have a supportive and nice environment and you can create personal interest in games that are added to and transformed by other people because you know I think it's harder like the bigger team gets to have a vision like a clear identity maybe um but other people bring their own taste to things their own flavor uh, and transform things into something you can't predict which is just so cool um yeah a friend of mine helped me. So here I was. Here's here's some of the stuff I was selling at the time. So you can see Kurt and a little poster. But I also had the games on CDs, which is just really nice. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then I had like some books of like stories and stuff as well. Um, so with Leah, our, we started working on ideas. And the first thing that came to mind was to make a diary style game. Uh, because, you know... I just wanted to like combine our loads of zines and comics and have something that mm-hmm. felt really natural and it just felt like a really personal touch that at, at that point wasn't there wasn't it wasn't being seen at the time I'd say mm-hmm. and this leads us to a font um yeah God, the early art for if find is so good <laughs> yeah I like it a lot it's got real it's got real yeah. character like um yeah so here's uh, If Found was originally called If Found, Please Return, uh, which I'm very happy with that title. Uh, mm-hmm. And Cassio and Cassiopeia were a single character who was basically an astronaut, maybe, mm-hmm. but an Irish person who always wore a space suit uh, and also like would sometimes be in space. It, it was kind of unclear <laughs> at this point. Uh, but we really like the image of this uh this girl in a spacesuit and here is like probably one of the first drawings of chance where like uh, Casio meets him at a bus stop which you'll see shortly uh and yeah here's some screenshots from this first demo that we made uh if found really came together from the combination of the diary plus the erasing um we were working on a witch diary game first of all where different witches would talk to you through the diary and you would also go to class or something. And each chapter was going to be based around a different spell. Um, but I started to think that having a different spell for every chapter like, could be a little tacky. Where the mechanics were very on the nose. And it was very obvious what we were trying to communicate. And once we came up with the erasing mechanic. Uh, so I realized I could use that old tech that I have. To not only erase like one layer. But if we could put things, you know, like an accordion, like in loads of layers, you could erase, 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 erase. Uh, and once we put that, it's like, oh, this is so good. We should just make the whole game about erasing and the diary. Uh, we still have the zooming mechanic here at this point as well, which you'll see in a minute. Uh, so the zooming mechanic gave this kind of uh, scale to things. So it felt like, okay, it has to be the end of the world. Um, but the story was very different at this point. Uh, it was Cassio would go on dates with different characters, including Chance, and then at the end erase them uh, because of it going badly. Uh, it was kind of like an anti-dating sim in a sense. Uh, and we'll talk about how that changed as we went on, but will we play this old version? Yeah, let's. Okay, okay, let's check it out. Uh, so yeah, we brought it around Europe to a couple of different events. Uh, like Eve, you came yeah. with me to uh, London, which was really fun, and then we took it to a maze okay. as well. Cool, so this is the original demo from 2016. Um, mm. Here you can see the cutout effect and it is Casio cutting out to uh, some kind of weird trippy background and some mm. particles. This, this is not the prettiest uh, title screen, but it worked. It I do like it though. Yeah, it's got nice colors. Mm. Uh, I, I do like that font. We use that font for loads of things for ages. Uh, Moonflower. Yeah. So, first biggest difference you want to see is if you hold down the right click button, you can drag and move the camera. And, and essentially the game still works like this, but we uh, we, uh, we wanted to make it a bit more accessible, which, which you'll see later. So, and then here it tells you mouse wheel. It doesn't tell you what it does, but uh, I think I was still of the opinion that, you know, much like the opening of the game where it doesn't tell you to erase, like, I think it's nice when you figure out the controls yourself. Um... So it doesn't don't explicitly tell you that mouse wheel like zooms in, but I do tell you to use it. Um, I can also use the buttons on the keyboard for a bit smoother. So here you can see our diary. Um, 
this book belongs to Cassio. And actually, this 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 book belongs to, or at least this line actually is still the same. I think we had to replace this book belongs to because it had to be translated. Um, there's also an effect here you can see, which is very distracting, though I do have a certain fondness for it, where everything gets kind of fuzzy yeah. on and off, like you're kind of fuzzing in and out. Um, yeah. Ever since Curtin, I do like putting post-processing on things, just have everything kind of changing constantly. It's kind of pulsing. Mm. Uh, here, we do explicitly tell you how to control it. Well, we do say interact rather than arrays. Uh, and it's okay, you can do it, keep going. Because once people would start doing this, they would uh, they would get nervous and they wouldn't, they wouldn't want to erase anymore. Um, the 11th of October. I went to the bus stop this morning and I met a guy called Mac. It rained. And then here we have like more layers than we got to do with it fine probably. Uh, this is how it ends. Where there's like writing from different from different periods. I think with it fine we were just trying to get through the whole story. So we, we didn't go back over as many sections. 40 days left. Um, yeah, there was more of an explicit countdown also. Yeah. But, I sometimes wonder in yeah. the finished version of If Found if people like pick up on the uh, like implicit tension of the the New Year's Eve thing. Uh, um, which tension specifically? Do. Just that sense of like that this is kind of a countdown to the end of the month. Oh, okay. Um, so here yeah. you can see that kind of raises like those systems we had before were also a bit like dodgier. Uh, but here you can see we're actually going to jump to like this different scene. There's like you saw a cutaway there that's like kind of showing some behind the scenes stuff a little bit. Like the edges are a bit less mm. polished. Uh, but this is nice. You're raising like underneath the character rather than the character themselves. That kid hasn't mm. moved. Yeah, I, I'm, I am really fond of this. It, it is kind of like a different game. Um, yeah. He saw me. Don't look at him. So you're raising, and then when you find something, yeah, you'll zoom into it. Oh, hi. Hey, I saw you sitting over there. Are you spying on me? So the very first character we drew was Chance, and like his design, I think it changed quite a bit, you know, but some things definitely stayed the, the same. I don't think we were allowed to have this symbol in the in the final game, <laughs> um, but like his fluffy jackets and uh, yeah. big shoes and stuff. Got style. <laughs> yeah. At this point, like, also, I think it's worth, like, adding, like, you know, like, we do have, our game is, you know, it's a big trans, big gay game, but mm. we didn't even know it when we were doing this, you know? Um, mm. I guess, like, I, mean, I guess Cassio probably wasn't sure of her feelings for other people, but, like, if this was an anti-dating sim, it was kind of like a, you know, it was, like, Hat. <laughs> um, what do you listen to? So here you can see, like, it's all a bit scrappier, uh, and it doesn't really have the kind of composed scenes that uh, it found uh, eventually, you know, has. But there's like a nice, like, kind of joy to its unpolishedness. Mm. Uh, I think the different color text is supposed to be the different two characters. So Cassie yeah. was asking, how do you find this stuff? So as they're listening to the, the K-pop, uh, Leah was dying uh, when we added K-pop. Uh, she was much too embarrassed, lest anyone think mm -hmm. Cassie was her. Or it was her idea to add K-pop in, but I was just like, hey, you draw cool, cool K-pop characters. Um, <laughs> and it, it wasn't set in 1993 at this point. Here, look at this old like yeah. little sketch. It's also like, I think there was a slightly different tenor to K-pop fandom in like 2015, 2016. It hadn't quite got as big. It was not as big, yet. yeah, definitely. Yeah. It's wild how fast these things change. Mm. Um, but there's, there's also a different tenor to the game, you know, I think, uh, yeah. I think it's definitely, it's a lot lighter and it's a lot less kind of, it's less sure of itself. <laughs> So, um, Chance is already crushing on Cassio, though. Yeah, and the, the dialogue is really good. Cassio's a bit oblivious. I think this was all written, like, kind of stream of consciousness, mostly, uh, yeah. one day. I think it was, like, tweaked, but it was, like, mostly written in, like, a, I think, like, a stream of consciousness hour. 
mm. uh, back in Fumbly, which is where my old my, my original desk was. So here, and this is like a really cool thing that we see a little bit in the gig, but nowhere else, where we return to something we saw previously. Uh, and this is actually the exact same scene earlier. Um, the only difference is these like erases were added so people would not think the demo was over and realize, oh wait, there's something behind here. Can I erase this now? So you erase the book. Uh, the music changes here also. It's really nice. It starts like this kind of like backwardsy music uh and then the um, max days yeah if i remember correctly when we took it to, to egx in london yeah. uh this bit was still a sticking point for people like they yeah. would get they even though we put in the erases they would still get stuck there yeah um yeah i love this bit so then this bit here is like a, an effect you see a couple times in the game uh, i think it's very yeah. unexpected here but instead of erasing, you're kind of adding in scribbles, uh, which is really neat. Yeah. And then finally, this I still can't erase Max, Max name. I erase mm. Mac, erase all the writing, and now I can erase the name. And here we see this looks like it's a bit stretched actually. <laughs> if on, please return, coming soon. And it's kind of nice. Here you can see like the eraser is very. Like the frost makes it look a bit softer, but it's like literally, uh, it's very harsh. Yeah, we changed yeah. like the erasing, like how the erasing works. It changed a bit since this version. Uh, there was like a last bit. It's not in here. We would see. Oh, there was a last one where we'd see Cassio floating in space. Unless we erased yeah. through that. I think we might have erased through that. So hey, that was the old demo. Um, it was really good. Like I think that was uh. It really had a character. Um, mm -hmm. I tried to have, even though this was just like, oh, hello, it's Cassio. Oh, hello, it's Chance. You know, the characters hadn't, don't really do anything. I tried to have the idea of structure by coming back to the diary again, you know, uh, but it wasn't fully developed because this wasn't a full game yet. And actually, uh, following that demo, we did take some time off from working on it, like I would say. We started a lot of other projects, uh, which you can see lots of cool art from here. And here's an early version of it found. But here's like three, uh, two other projects. This is a, a spooky game, and then this was uh, this was kind of like an interpersonal game. Um, and then mm -hmm. Leah is doing all of this art. Uh, although I think like Aiden Wall uh, might have done this composition with the characters. Um, but we kind of got scared off from working on it found. Uh, we had basically all these ideas of what we wanted to do with it but it was um it was too big and we wanted to make a small game get some money because still we were struggling with this thing like how do we work on something full time you know how do we how do we get that money um yeah you want your thoughts at this time um yeah i mean this was like a point i think where we were kind of like we had intersected and I had worked with you guys for a bit and then for various reasons of my own, mostly health reasons, I had kind of um, stepped away. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's that thing of like, right? Like to commit to a project, you need time, you need resources yeah. and you need money. And it's yeah. just without that, you do end up, I think, kind of floundering right. or like trying to figure out I think it can be very hard to figure out what the best use of your resources is when yeah. and we were planning for don't have that support. We were planning for Kickstarters and all kinds of things, which, mm. like, I would be so scared of doing that, you know, because yeah. you're promising a game that's so far out, and even seeing, like, how if I'm developed over its course, like, it changed so radically, you know, you, you have no idea what the game is so close to the start. But yeah, you're totally right, like, we just didn't have the ability to pay literally for you to, like, keep working with us. Um... I still, you know, had some money and like Leah, you know, was still working on that. Uh, but I'm pretty sure like, you know, she, she had her own like side project and stuff at the same time. Mm. Uh, I think this was a mistake, you know, I think we could have kept working on it fine. Um, yeah. But, you know, it was exciting to start something new. Uh, but then at the end yeah. of 2016 uh, was when... Uh, we won a big Irish award, the Irish Design Awards, and it was the first time video games were ever included. Uh, and funny, actually, Curtin won a Writers Guild of Ireland award uh, as well. Uh, like the previous year, it was the first time games were included with that. But it was the first time like games were included in the Design Awards, and we 
like it kind of swept the board you know it won best newcomer best overall all these kind of things and it was just like oh wow this like really does resonate with people and uh yeah there's something special here so like yeah maybe we should stick with it and actually uh then this is where Annapurna comes in so we I got a, another kind of scholarship to go to GDC in 2017 and this was a scholarship for people with the IGDA people who've been in the industry for a while you know uh maybe they're uh, trans like myself or, or maybe they're like you know um black or like you know different kind of like more marginalized backgrounds than typically what video game developers are made up of so people that had experience and it was kind of giving them like another kind of uh connections and another kind of like kind of like teaching and stuff uh, and it was mostly like honestly you know meeting the people through that and obviously the, you know the ability to travel to gdc helped a lot so on a on a on a wing and a prayer um while we were there i was like oh sure while i'm in gdc i will pitch to a bunch of publishers and we talked to a bunch of them uh, and annapurna was one of those and annapurna like from the off where the the most excited and the most friendly they had actually seen um the teaser that we had put out like uh, probably the year before um so some of the developers some of the publishing team in annapurna and they're quite small but they're you know they're very clued in on the the, the indie game sphere uh so they had like heard of the game but it was them playing it, you know, and they were like, oh, wow, you know, like, this is mature storytelling. It has this unique mechanic, you know, it has a unique art style. It's, like, hitting all these points. It just felt the perfect mark match for them. Um, at the time, they had just announced, you know, um, I'm not sure that Edith Finch had even come out at this point, you know. Um, this uh, Maybe maybe it just had, you know, uh, but they had just announced themselves, like, a few months prior. Uh, and they were kind of the new kids on the block at the point. Uh, and yeah, like basically all of 2017 uh, was negotiating with them while I still like teached. And while unfortunately we worked on other games like Fools. Uh, but I mean, it's good because like we're like picking up some of those projects now. So, you know, it all comes around. Um, and at the start, I think probably we still scope the game too big, you know. And I think we probably should have been clearer on what they wanted to see from us you know uh so that's like one thing we learned was yeah having having that vision the whole way through um and working with them you know it was it was really good you know they were just so supportive the whole time uh they were they were always yeah very supportive and uh yeah they really saw us through to release uh so we started with them in 2018 and then obviously the game came out in 2020 uh, the first step in our process was getting a coder, you know, like obviously, you know, my background is in programming, but it's not what excites me. Uh, there are some developers who can do everything, uh, but, you know, that's like a certain kind of game. And it's also, those people are demons. <laughs> uh, uh, so, you know, we were lucky to hire Tim. Um, like, honestly, I knew just like, you know from talking to him and he was he was just so honest and he just had so like he was just so focused on the work itself you know and uh, mm. he kind of wanted to work in a in a in a more in a more kind of like worker focused place i would say um you know he wanted to um you know i mean this is the challenge and this is why i got that scholarship to gdc is that like people with experience you know it's like you can put up with like tough game development situations for a few years you know if you're lucky like i have i have ms and you know that is one thing that makes it harder to do that you know um but after a few years like even the most healthy and uh and uh like strong-minded people will will start to burn out uh so he he if he was gonna say in games wanted a change of pace and uh, i think you know it worked out really well for both of us um so actually, I think this is probably a good moment to talk about some of the tech stuff. So our first like step was taking the old demo and updating the tools such that A, we could navigate the scenes quickly and build them out quickly. And then two, uh, how we develop and design the areas and the levels uh, could work as well. Uh, and like basically, you know, if you can make a tool to make something faster to do, that's just going to be, you know, it's going to like save you so much work. 
So for anyone who's not familiar, um, in Unity, you have kind of a list of all your objects that are in the scene. You have a view of your scene. You have your game window, which is what the end result will look like. And then you have project windows and like inspectors and things like this. You know, this is all the Unity default stuff. But then on top of it, we've coded our own tool called the workflow tools, which let us move through it. Uh, so first of all, here you can see all the different parts of our scene. Uh, so in if find, basically uh, the game is split up into pages. So this is a page, this is a page, this is a page, this is a page. Um, you can see they're all very different in space, but then inside each page, you can go forward in depth. So that's an erase layer, that's an erase layer, that's an erase layer, that's an art attack. Um, uh, yeah, so like here you can see like things disappearing as we go through it. Um, and then we can go sideways to another one. And as you go in, you can still see we have the zoomy. So like things get really small. You can see them getting tiny there. And we can zoom all the way in here. Uh, uh, because players don't have direct control over it. it's not as obvious anymore but it's still in there um but yeah these tools let us you know this tells us the size of the camera uh, and lets us move through the scenes like like sideways and forwards like really nicely um, back to zero uh here you can see lots of kind of boxes and stuff as well let me take like a, a diary for like how the erasing works would be a good example so so here we go uh this yellow box here is like the size of the camera. So you can see it here. And the, the shaded portion is like an iPad, like three by two. Um, then we created tools for, you know, what needs to be erased. So you can see these scribbles. You need to like, you know, erase all these boxes. Not completely, but just like touch them. Uh, and we went through lots of iterations. Like we came up with a system so we could like remember what's been erased versus not. Uh, so it could all be loaded. Because uh, we really wanted to be able to jump straight back into the game. Um, but here, if I hit two, actually, you can see how this is kind of neat. Yeah, you can see how all of this is actually like in 3D in layers. That's kind of cool. <laughs> That's very cool. Yeah. And yeah, you can see how like, you know, the zoom is just wild. Uh, but then here we have things where we can add text. We can add, this is like a thing that will trigger stuff, add materials, add images. It's just like loads of tools. Here's lots of like little debug things. Uh, and then here's like our, this also has like loads of tools. It's like a real behind the scenes. Uh, so w once you hit the blue boxes, it will like trigger basically the next, the next ones. Cause that's been erased. Uh, here on the right, you're like, where did everything go? So we'll pull it out. And here we're probably using Unity how it's probably not supposed to be used, which is like deep list. But honestly, it actually made a lot of sense for us where, um, if I select, let me go back to zero. But yeah, like everything's kind of like embedded within itself. So like layer zero is this one. Layer one is this one. Layer two is this one. And basically the order in which these things are in the layer show the order they are in uh, the art. So if I put the, this is, I've selected now um, this kind of like wall and gate and stuff. I can put it underneath like the sky, for example. And yeah, you can see it all kind of almost disappears. Um, and then we have like nice things where we can recolor. This is one of my favorite ones. Like we made it like a little shader where you can change the color of something like really quickly. So we wouldn't have to mess in with uh, Photoshop or anything like that. So we can not only change um, the color of the, the fill, but also the line color, which is really nice. Um, mm -hmm. And essentially like how we found was made was by making these little compositions, you know, within each other and yeah, just building it out. So it actually got quite fun. You know, we, we got to, I would say, I would say, you know, uh, well, we'll talk about this a little bit in a bit, but mid 2019 was when we were really building out all like the scenes, you know, and it got furiously fast by the end of 2019. Uh, but yeah. Is there anything else on this you think I should point out, Eve? Ah, uh, you've covered everything pretty well. So I mean, this uh, is unless you want to show fungus. Yeah, but... so I can show fungus. That's like how things are scripted. Uh, so yeah, that's our layouts. So this is all like you know the art and stuff. Um, we have like a manager scene, which uh, so there's like two scenes. Like there's the scene you're in, and then there's a manager scene, which is like things that happen in every scene. 
Um, mm-hmm. So just like you need a pause menu, you know, it needs to be able to work. And, you know, here's some like debug functions. Um, and yeah, the flowchart is our scripting language. So I'll open up Fungus. So Fungus mm-hmm. is a tool that was developed by um, some Irish developers, actually. Uh, mm-hmm. Open flowchart window. And is this the right one? Yeah, here we go. Uh, it was developed by Irish developers for making like adventure kind of games. Uh, and it came out like, I say late 2013. I started using it in 2014, first with Curtain, you know, very hacked. And then it got like some more big updates, maybe 2015, maybe 2016. I think 2015 might've been, might've been the, the last ones. And since then the developers have gone on to, you know, develop, you know, scripting kind of tools for Romero games. Uh, and even like, you know, there are like some of the, the, the lead programmers on the, on Empire of Sin uh, by Romero Games, like our Ireland's first big outside AAA game, which is cool. But what yeah. what Fungus allows you to do is you can set up basically loads of commands that happen in order. So mm-hmm. when we go to the foam birth scene, you know, uh, it's going to disable the raising for a second because it's a cutscene kind of, and we want to get like some lines of dialogue. It's going to like wait commands and all this kind of stuff. There's like a like if for switch, there's like a rumble. Uh, we set mm-hmm. like the post processing here, and the post processing is like something that takes the final image and uh, and like tweaks all the colors and, and that kind of thing, you know. Uh, mm-hmm. So if we play it, like actually, we can probably even see it. So here's phone booth. So I'll have that open, and we'll play it. We'll see it go through these different things. And here you can see here's all the different commands. Like for a new game, we've moved on from fungus, but yeah, fungus, you know, like did us well for a long time. We I got a lot of use yeah. out of it. Um, it's probably one of the big missing parts of Unity is having a kind of scripting language, you know, rather than just mm-hmm. writing actual code, um, mm-hmm. which isn't really, I mean, you can't do that, but uh, it isn't always the most uh, the, the most effective way to do things. Mm. Okay, so let me see, phone booth. So here we can see, we already went through all those ones, and we can see the, I think the hue color is going to be changing over the next while. Here it makes like that whole transparent thing. It's stuck on a hello until I click play. Hello, hello. So good to hear you. Uh, so and there's loads and like it's all the audio stuff that Ellie added in. So yeah, I mean this is a nice like behind the scenes of it. Like at least of where yeah. if I ended up, you know, uh, it's a lot of yeah. you know always it's a question of like oh if you're to make this game like from start like now that you know exactly what the game is exactly what the tools you need. It would be like a cinch, <laughs> but it's like the process of developing all this, which is uh, really cool. Here's like all the different characters that are talking in this scene, I guess, the different positions of where dialogue would happen. Okay, I mean this is we're getting really into the weeds here, but I yeah. mean, the main thing I want to show is like the zooming and like you know moving through the layers because I think that's cool. Uh, here you can see like a big um, chunky piece of art that's like I don't even know where, where yeah. it was from. It's a good question. <laughs> Um, but yeah, it's a, it's a great summary. And I mean, as you said, like this doesn't cover, there were intermediate iterations on a lot of this stuff. That, yeah, you like, can see the effects then right. changed. Yeah. And this is just core also, there is like, a, I'll talk about it more just generally, but like mechanics at the end, which is their whole own thing. Yes. Uh, but here you can see like, this is also another like shader where it's like getting distorted over time, you know, and probably yeah. like, you see, this One is of like... the lessons of it found is definitely like you can do a lot with shaders. <laughs> yeah, yeah, they find is generally like made out of. I mean, I think in general, the layouts like they're probably done by me and you, and then Bree and mm-hmm. Brogan also did like a number of them, uh, mm-hmm. and Leah sometimes would do like a layer, but it was mostly like creating lots of art, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, so it was kind of like an experimentational process, which was fun. Okay, so let's jump back through and like finish off this this talk. <laughs> so that was the tool side of thing. We had to get it all to work uh, and work on all the different platforms. Uh, and then here was like the big kind of like t- turn in the game project, I would say, was moving from what you saw in that original demo where you have free movement to what I found now is, which is more of a visual novel, you know, kind of thing. And, you know, this came by because basically it was like you needed to be an octopus to play the game at one point, you know? And uh, it was also like we had to choose whether we wanted to, like, you know, focus on the story for release or focus on the mechanics, you know? We, like, we were we were taking a while to develop the game. Mm-hmm. Uh, but, yeah, we, we just thought the mechanics were too complicated. It was too messy. 
Uh, and specifically the zooming and the free control. Um, like, people making the game could were, find it difficult to, to make. And then if we're thinking about bringing this to iOS or bringing it to Switch, you know, it's like, how are we going to do that? Um, so... Yeah, we kind of just dropped the free movement, you know? We brought it back in certain small sections to kind of break it up, you know? But we, like, also brought in the dialogue boxes, which weren't there originally to break up uh, the 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 dialogue as well, which is here. It's just one of like, the first, like, scenes off it, uh, which is cool. Mm. So, yeah, it's like sometimes, you know, you got to focus on what's the important thing. And for F5, it was the erasing, you know, and it was Cassio's journey. And so, like, all those mechanics you don't get to use, you know, you can use them in something else is usually how it goes. So, Challenge 3 was, the story hadn't come together yet, you know. We'd worked on the game, what, like, nine months or something. And we had lots of cool chapters, you know, we had a gig chapter. We had, we had a, a snowy chapter, but they didn't really gel together and we kind of still had this oh this is still only like a, a sixth of what we want to do you know we I mean, had all these kind of individual chapters were quite nice but it wasn't like a full game um so yeah i think this is where you came in and also like claire branken at the time uh who helped with you know adding like a really claire branken came in and we talked about the, the, the family came into it and it became a lot more personal um but this is where Jack and Colin, first of all, were kind of like, when, like, because each character would only be in it for a chapter. You'd have a chapter with Shant, a chapter with another character, etc. We needed two characters who'd be there the whole time. And that became Colin and Jack, uh, who would, who were also like this older gay couple. You know, like, I mean, not even older, but like older in LGBT terms where they've been there before you, you know? Yeah. Uh, and there's someone that Katsu could look up to. Um, here we have the black hole in the background. Uh, but it still wasn't really there, you know? Um, it wasn't really good enough. I mean, what was your, like, thoughts on the game at that point? Yeah, when I came back on... Well, I say back on, but really it was kind of also coming in for the first time. Uh, it was the end of 2018. Mm -hmm. And like you said, like, there were lots of cool parts to the game. But I do remember also that I was kind of, like, floundering, trying to figure out, like, who the characters were still a little bit and like yeah. what their dynamics with each other were and like um what kind of what they were all building towards yeah. which i think was something that we uh we had a lot of conversations about. yeah um and i think then over this next like six months is really when it started to click and then the final like nine months mm -hmm. was just like cranking out content um mm -hmm. In 2019, like, the start of it, like, uh, yourself joined, Brie joined, which was, like, a great, like, uh, up until this point, um, almost entirely, not completely, but, like, Leo was doing all the art, you know, and Brie was someone who had games experience and more technical experience and could bridge the gap between Tim and Leah, uh, mm -hmm. uh, and you should look, Brie Chu, like, Nosferat Chu, like, Nosferat Chu, Nosferat Chu, but with a Chu at the end. Uh, on Twitter, uh, and they're a really awesome artists, and you should follow them and hire them. Mm -hmm. uh, they're not working with us at the moment for our current project, but you know, we'd definitely love to work with them again. Uh, Brogan yeah. Hackett came on, Brogan's like a great Irish indie, and then like there are two new music people, Tumelo and El Ellie. Uh, mm -hmm. And then for the game itself, like the big, the big thing was going deep on the characters rather than going wide. So we cut down the number of characters to like literally we just okay, Cassio and Chance, what are their journeys? <laughs> and mm -hmm. like even just Cassio and then like why is Cassio wanting to raise like the world and everything it's like oh mm -hmm. she is like dissociating from reality you know and then also she's having these issues with her family and at that point it was kind of like a head cannon or like like I was like okay Cassio's trans but it's not gonna really come into the story you know um but we we said it we moved it to Ackle you know and that was like really the clincher we moved from our like made up kind of YA kind of island, which was a kind of a mythical island off, off Sligo and Donegal, I think, or off Mayo. I mean, like it was kind of based on Ackle anyway, but we were too scared to say Ackle, and they were like, okay, like let's just go for it. And, and I remember Leah was scared to do that, but then like you know, literally a day later, we forgot that we were scared, and it was just like how it was. And now we could start like 
scouting real locations, you know, thinking about like how they lived their lives, you know, the schools they went to. Um, Mm -hmm. And we just really embraced it being more personal. Uh, Cassio's mom became such a big thing and like her brother later. And uh, yeah. And then uh, all that led kind of like uh, we had to put together a teaser, you know, which was, you know, one of those good things when you have a publisher is like, you guys got to ship this game, you know, we got to announce it. So uh, in August, I think the end of August 2019, we put out the trailer uh, and it really, you know, conveyed the vibes and everything we're going for. And uh, yeah, I think at that point, like mechanics were kind of locked. Uh, I think like art wise, like we still had kind of like some effects that didn't end up in the final game. We went with different effects, but uh, mm-hmm. yeah, it was, I think like, if I'm started to be what if I'm was, you know. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then finally, so the Eraser mechanic has gone on this journey and it's like changed formats and styles, but the big thing was still, where is this story going? And there was always the end of the world. Uh, and then what it became was Cassio erasing herself. Uh, and there's even a nice moment where the Eraser kind of like is controlled itself. But we always had in the back of our minds we wanted to have, like I wanted to have like almost an RPG at the end where you had loads of choices because the game presents you with so few choices because this is Cassio's experience, you know, she she doesn't see the choices that she has, I guess, so she doesn't feel she has choices. Um, I wanted the ending to be like a complete rejection of that and uh, we had uh, uh, Charlene Putney who's a great writer and uh, she worked on Divinity Original Sin 2. <laughs> Uh, so we had like a big famous RPG writer working on an RPG with us, which would be the ending. But it all just felt like a bit random. Uh, so we kind of mixed both. We kind of had like the spacey elements, but we also just had the characters into the future. And I think seeing the characters into the future is such a hopeful thing. You know, you wouldn't even like realize it. And uh, yeah, like these mechanics all came in like quite late. Like the end of the end of 2019, start of 2020, we were developing these last mechanics and even the character creator was like the very last thing we did not tell Annapurna we just snuck it in (laughs) but it's so brilliant it's like the best it's the best part it's like you know it's like waking up from like sleep and being like the game has to have a character creator and then like putting it in it's like that's when things are like going well um yeah what are your feelings on the ending yeah it's it's interesting um it's so I mean it's so good um it's interesting, like, how we got there. Mm-hmm. I think if there's, like, one lesson I take away from the process of, like, getting through a found, it's, like, all of the stuff that scared us or that we were nervous about mm-hmm. ended up being the best and most rewarding stuff. Um, okay. Like the ending and stuff, or...? Yeah, I think so. I think, you know, especially in terms of, like, the more, like, particularly thinking about, like, the... You know, Cassio being trans, yeah. setting it on Akal, like yeah. really diving into the characters was scary, but it and it was really good. And yeah. the more like direct and honest we got with that, the better it got. And that was also really where the ending came from, was I think like a desire to be very, you know, honest about the potential futures of these characters, right? Like not wanting to leave it on a note that felt like overly gloomy or depressing well, we, we never was... we really wanted even though like okay like if i had mm-hmm. always set out to be a game that ended with the end of the world especially mm-hmm. like we never wanted it to be a hopeless game but now especially that it was also a trans game which it didn't start out as we did not mm-hmm. want to have a sad trans ending you know um yeah. like we had like discussions on you know whether cassio's mom or like maggie or who would be there for her you know and i think like I went a more personal direction and I felt like it was it was really the mom's journey, um, a little bit. Yeah. Um although I did like we put in that extra piece of art later where it was like Maggie and Colin are at the door, um mm-hmm. when uh when uh Breach uh, embraces her, her kid. Uh, and the message for me with that was just like, you know, you can't really convince people off like training you with humanity, you know, it's kinda of just something that has mm-hmm. to you can't convince them rationally, it kinda of just has to come from them. But with the mechanics, yeah, it was really, like, payoff for all the time you've spent erasing and all that kind of stuff and, like, yeah. giving that twist. Like we talked about way back ago, it's, like, presenting the diary, not just as, you know, it's, like, seeing it from an- another angle. So it's not just this thing that holds all your secrets that you want to get rid of, but it's also something mm-hmm. that holds your future, you know? Mm-hmm. Uh, which was really cool. So we wanted to have hope. 
Uh, and that was like best encapsulated yeah. with the character, you know? That, that really worked. Yeah. Uh, so we got to the end. Uh, here you can see our Meta Metacritic score from the 88. Very nice. Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, my birth year. Um, mm -hmm. It's on Switch here. Unlike, you know, I think, like, I think another thing that really helped is in, I think it was probably 2019, we kind of moved to a four day week, you know, and mm. I think we were able to work faster and better and like more productively because we weren't like just burnt out constantly. Um, mm -hmm. And I think even with like being like, you know, we were behind where we wanted to be with finishing the game, you know, and we we're like, oh, the game really should have come out a couple months ago, or whatever, you know, we're really trying to like, this is the last <laughs> night we could possibly hit. And we were really trying to hit that, but I don't think we crunched, you know, we had... We had deadlines and we had weeks where we did like work more and work late, but we did try to take breaks after those uh, to recover, and I think that helped. I mean, you, I mean, I'm the, I'm the director, so I can't really say that, you know. So uh, like you as like, um... yeah, I think there were there were some really stressful weeks, yeah. but they were always just stressful weeks. Like we never had a stressful month. I thought, well. Maybe the last <laughs> month was kind of yeah, stressful like, overall, I mean, I, but like that's that's inevitable, right? Yeah, we had even if everything had been done. I, I the think last what month I was proud of was just making people take breaks after we did have a late night yeah. stressful thing, you know? Yeah, um, yeah. I, I think one of the reasons why the end was stressful was because of COVID, you know? Um, yes, our videos yeah. had demonetized by Steam. <laughs> because of covid like like specifically testing the game at the end with our with uh doing that remotely with like a like a, yeah. a testing company was very difficult because they had never done it before either and we yeah. also all got sick for a month which was very fun um <laughs> when you're doing all these things at the end uh so we did yeah. have like a little breathing room afterwards to make the switch version and like you know start preparing mm -hmm. our next game um mm -hmm. Which was nice, and we got to like fix a couple things. Um, yeah. Although I like, there's still a few parts of the narrative I think are kind of like not clear enough to players, which I like. Mm -hmm. I would like the directors caught a little bit. I think probably Casio mom gets the drawing, you know, and I think it wasn't clear that this is the same piece of paper that they had previously. So I would make that clearer. I was trying to keep yeah. the surprise of what it was, but I think people just didn't realize that, that they'd done anything. Um, yeah. And also, like, maybe the relationship between uh, Mac and Cassio's mom and stuff could have been established more. Honestly, like, director's cut version, I'd be so tempted to go in and, like, stick that childhood drawing into the diary. Like, put some sellotape on it, yeah. like, put it into the diary. Because, yeah. like you said, like, people just... It's it's the one thing that I really think people don't make that connection. I'd also like to add, like, more free movement sections, you know? I, th mm -hmm. I think the interesting thing, like, getting, getting to the end of this is that, you know, the product is the result of the time that goes into making it, you know, and it's kind of like a memento of that yeah. time as well. Uh, and I think that's really awesome. You know, this game was shaped by, like, all the different directions, but mm -hmm. we didn't set out with an exact plan, you know, and uh, yeah. there's going to be bits and pieces that you miss and uh, yes. there's going to be choices. You know, Always. we did choose to focus on the narrative over necessarily... Uh, you know, if the narrative was shorter, the mechanic probably would have been, like, uh, fresher for longer, you know? Um, mm -hmm. But I think that's kind of the great thing about games and stuff as well, and all kinds of media, is that it is, it is imperfect. Um, yeah. yeah. And, like, Absolutely. For, for me, like, it was just, like, like, okay, whatever about reviews, the most important thing was just, like, people's reactions, you know? I didn't... The one thing that really surprised me was just how much this game made people cry. I just didn't even think of that, you know? Like, I cried a couple times during development, um, but that was probably more when the game was closer, like, closer to done. Um, mm. Although some of, the, some of it was when we were writing those scenes as well. But yeah, I just can't believe that, like, had that effect on people. It was wild. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> our secret, <laughs> our secret agenda. Uh, yeah. But yeah, like, for us, it was a huge, you know, like, your first, like, game, you know, while it's not necessarily my first game, I've made, like, a hundred uh over 100 it's like the first like big commercial thing as a as a studio you know it's like mm -hmm. it just makes it easier from here to go going on to our next thing so mm -hmm. in summation uh, and here you can see the journey here's like one of the very first pieces of cassio to uh one of the very last pieces of cassiopeia and here's one of the last mm -hmm. pieces of cassio and here's another one which is just johnson cassio running this one yeah this one's really neat so um, good. 
So what were we talking about? Yeah, this whole big, this whole big chat, this whole blue. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope there was enough interesting bits and pieces in here. Uh, but yeah. so you can see the evolution of the erasing uh, from the early, the early version uh, in college where it was like pre-made assets that just caught a single time to the original versions of If Found where you were drawing polygons basically and the polygons cut through to all we have now where it's like series of textures with all kinds of filters and magic on them. Uh, and then also making that work, that version in the demo, like what you can erase is determined by the, the level of zoom you were at, which is very finicky. Uh, mm. Whereas now it's determined by have you erased something or not, you know? Uh, and there's like one or two like places where oh someone got stuck you know and we probably could have like with a bit more like you know time we could catch those but they're all fixable which is great um, mm -hmm. and then the game structure which is like actually not just having an idea and like oh here's all the events but how is this a journey you know uh, so mm -hmm. how does Cassio you know how does her relationship evolve both with the band you know and with Chance in particular um mm -hmm which is like a harsh one uh but it's also ultimately nice when they're friends at the end uh because we don't want just to, like we don't want everyone just to be like oh and they're a couple and it was like yay uh it's nice that they're just friends uh but they're like real good like life friends you know uh but also the mechanics you know and like seeing this erasing okay it changes up a little bit but mostly at the end you see like this whole other thing and then finally like you know the team uh Going from my work in Scotland where I felt I felt isolated and so I came back to Ireland and made myself isolated where like, oh, I can only make interesting games solo to actually we've built a really cool team and we all support each other. And mm. uh, yeah, it's just been nice. And it's just like, yeah, ready to work on the next one. This is how If Find was finished. Uh, yeah. All of us. Yeah, it's a big enough team. And then it was obviously there was lots of people that like, contributed bits and pieces, you know, yeah. um, throughout uh, that really add to it. And then next time, this is the point I was going to show a teaser of what we're working on. Uh, but I thought everything was way too spoilery. So here's some robots. <laughs> uh, they're cool robots. They're like breakdancing Doctor Who robots. Um, but yeah, like going oh, yeah. into the next game, like we've been working on it. Like I probably shouldn't say how long we've been working on it. Like I guess it's only like six months, really, like five months. Uh, like since the um, Switch version was done, uh, and uh, yeah, like we're working on it full time from the start, which is good. It does mean we have less like material to build off going straight in, unlike with it found where we already had like a really good demo. Okay. But we still have lots of things we worked on the past to pull from. But the main thing is we have the team, you know. Um, yeah, we finished a nice demo in January, but we shouldn't talk too much about it. <laughs> no. So yeah, but... we, we still love experimentation, but yeah. Yeah. I mean, you're absolutely right. Like, the most important thing is the team um, getting on well with everybody. Yeah. Um, and also, like like you said, like, respecting everybody, um, treating each other well. You know, like, you, you only end up damaging yourself in the project if you, like, I don't know, if you, like, punish other people and, and like, not you specifically. No, I know, I know. Like, but you like, never do that. But also, like, you know, I think... <laughs> I think, like, it's very easy as a yeah. small developer to get fixated and, like, burning yourself to, to death, yeah. you know, to work really hard for something. But the thing is, like, yeah. if you achieve that, you know, then you're going to be like, oh, okay, what now? i got to burn myself to death again. And you're probably not going to be able to. You'll probably be, like, too burnt out. Whereas, like, my yeah. focus with Dreamfield is I really want to, like, you know, build something that is, um, like, week in, week out. We're working just at, like, a good, sustainable pace and it is enjoyable, you know, because this is our lives, you yeah. know? Game developers yeah. are people too, and uh, like I, I would definitely like to see uh, a future for game development where, because I mean, like in film, okay, it's like mm -hmm. depending on your role, it's like three months of really hard work, and then you're like mm -hmm. got a break before you get the next project. But in game development, there's no kind of like break except okay, you mass layoffs, which just isn't very good because they're not paid for that. Um, yeah. So I would like to see a future definitely where. Uh, yeah, it's all a lot more sustainable and we're not just taking in like young people, burning the market and a new crop of young people uh, and then like a, a small sliver yeah. of middle management, uh, you know, staying along. Yeah, absolutely. And also I just want to see more cool and strange games, you know. Uh, so hopefully we can develop some of those. Uh, you know, we're going to 
we're gonna make something really different next time but it's still gonna be it's still gonna be experimental still gonna be like narrative maybe not always narrative but next time it is anyway cool mm. uh any last thoughts eve no i think you said everything wow this was like a big long talk if you got to the end i hope you enjoyed it uh thank you so much yeah. like this is why we do this like okay it's nice to do this for like the festival and stuff but really we do this because like like yeah like we have an audience now we have fans you know so i hope um, i hope people like it uh so yeah take care be well thanks everyone and uh we'll see you in the future bye yeah bye